Hicks. <coughs> so, so today I'll be summarising some of the work on the late upper Paleolithic assemblage at Guildford Fire Station in Surrey and what the site might be able to reveal about human activity there and in the wider Lake Glacial landscape. And from the start I should stress that this is a collaborative project and it's still in progress and that many of the results are preliminary and unpublished. So the site was discovered in 2013 during evaluation work by Oxford Archaeology in advance of the building of the new fire station at Guildford, named as what it says on the tin. Um, the archaeological horizon is just below the present uh, land surface, as you can see there. The site, um, the other site, was not previously known, and the discovery could not have been predicted. But once it was found, Oxford Archaeology contacted Nick for expert advice, and then they ensured that there was an upper Paleolithic specialist working on the site, and you probably recognise Will Mills in many of the photos. Guildford Fire Station is a good example of where the planning process has worked well regarding these rare sites. In this case, Surrey County Council was both the planning authority and the developer, and they quickly recognised the rarity and importance of the site, um, and it was probably their support that ensured that time was allowed for excavation, and they've also been very supportive of the post-excavation work. So just to put you in context, a uh, quick look at Google, Google Maps at the top. You can see, um, I can't quite make this work. There's the old fire station, there's the site just before excavation. Skip ahead five years to June this year, and you'll see the new um, fire station. Uh, and I think it, this reminds me of what Daryl said earlier about trying to strip back the difficulty of stripping back modern developments to try and imagine the hunter gatherer life scheme. But if we pull back in Google Earth a little bit, you can see that the site li lies very near to the present valley floor close to the River Way. There's the way right there. There's the fire station. Uh, today, uh, the fire station is probably no more than a few hundred metres from the present river. And taking an even wider view here, looking at the geomorphology of the area, Guildford's right there. Oh, I can't make this work. Uh, sorry. So Guildford's where the red, the red, red circle is. Um, it's a city uh, on the way, which is a major tributary of the Thames. It runs north towards the Thames, and it cuts through this little bit here of the North Downs. Uh, the North Downs being the major rig of chalk hill, ridge of chalk hills in southeast England. Um, but where the river way cuts through there, it's one of these gaps that sort of divides the geomorphology of the area. If we look at this topographic map uh, prepared by Oxford Archaeology, it shows the landscape around the site and the site's relationship to the Way, the way River system as it flows downstream. And then here's this little gap right there. Uh, it's an excellent location um, for hunter-gatherers' activity for all sorts of reasons. That little gap probably provides that sort of erosion area, uh, provide a good source of flint raw material, it's a good hunting location, and perhaps somewhere in the area there's going to be a forward, as the name of the city itself um, indicates. These are a couple of images of the excavation in progress to show you what the site looked like during the excavations. The flint artifacts, are very well preserved and most are uncatenated. It was recognized at the time that microwear might be a possibility and the artifacts were all back unwashed and many retained their adhering sediments. And here's another little scatter here that actually includes a core. It was also obvious from the start that refitting was another very good possibility for looking at the site. The archaeological finds horizon lies in a sequence of medium to fine grain sands that overlie a coarse bed of flint cobbles, graded chalk and sandstone. 
And it's worth noting that both the solifluction deposits that underlie this sequence and the sands above form traceable units that can be followed over a wider area. And it will be perhaps possible in the future to trace these levels to perhaps predict the location of other similar sites. This is Oxford Archaeology's um, stratigraphic cross section through the site deposits. Um, G2 sands containing the artifacts there. And preliminary results from optically stimulated luminescence dating of these sounds has produced a really tight group of ages in the early middle phase of the Windermere into Stadium, so around 13,000 years ago. Of course, the first stage in any flint analysis is the classification uh, and assemblage composition, which was done by Nick and Mike and myself not long after the end of the excavation. Um, there are over 15,000 objects in the catalogue, and of these, about 5,500 were recovered during the excavation, and most of them have three dimensional coordinates. Uh, the rest were results from the processing of the environmental samples, mostly under two centimeters, and there are refits from that fine waste. Most of the um, stages of manufacture are can be found in the assemblage and even indicating that very tiny microdevelopment. The photo by Oxford Archaeology of some of the 120 plus retouched tools, nowhere near as many as London House and Bradley, but it's quite a different sort of, sort of site. And in this case, the Buren's depicted here on very well made blades. Uh, it's worth mentioning here that some of these blades were made by the so use of the soft hammer technique. They're very well prepared butts, and a lot of them do have on it for technique. Next step was the microware analysis, which was undertaken by our colleague Sonia Tomaso of Liège University, and she's very kindly allowed us to present some of her unpublished results. Sonia came to Oxford and she screened the entire assemblage macroscopically, identifying about 600 pieces with potential use wear traces. Um, of these, a sample of 337 artifacts was selected to be transported to Liège for more detailed microscopic analysis of trace on that. Um, trace the lab also has a very extensive archaeological, um, experimental archaeology program, and so there she had reference to an experimental reference collection of about 3,000 tools. These are the aims of the microware analysis to evaluate the surface condition of the flints, to identify the types of use wear, and to see what they can tell us about reconstructing human activities at the site. Uh, unfortunately, many of the artifacts turned out to uh, have been affected by surface alterations that could not be seen by the naked eye. And this is probably due to movement in the sandy deposits, and so they couldn't be included in the study. However, she did get very positive results for about 80 artifacts. So a quick summary of some of the findings. Um, the site does contain hunting projectiles, backed and retouched bladelets, which show damage and use wear traces typical of shot arrowheads. Here you, you see um, those uh, linear impact traces caused by detached flint particles scratching against the surface at the moment of impact. And here you've got some of those impact uh, fractures themselves. And it's perhaps worth mentioning here too that most of the back pieces, most of the points at Guildford are broken. Uh, is perhaps what they're doing on the site is, is retooling. Uh, although, goodness, there is a bike point there, probably not by them. Other evidence for other manufacturing activities you found there on the scrapers, uh, where the use work could be attributed to various stages of processing, mainly dry hides. This includes the heavy edge round associated with scraping dry animal hides on, on the bottom two pictures. On this perforator, she found distinct lateral edge damage associated with microscopic friction polish that indicates possible and or bone working activity. Here is the most frequent uh, occurring tool on the site. And on this one, she 
She's been finding wear traces that indicate use of grooving and percussion on hard material. She even found what she thinks is a striker light, uh, where the heavily rubbed end has rounding and deep striations characteristic of percussion against an iron ritual of probably pyrites. It was only when the microwave analysis could be, was finished that the refitting could start. We wanted to reduce the handling of this material until the analysis was finished. Uh, this work has been taking place at the Ashmolean Museum by myself and with Nick Barton. And the work, I should say also, the work was financed of both the refitting and the microwave by uh, Historic England, uh, as the need for this work couldn't have been pre predicted at the site before. Um, before the site was found. The refitting had very specific aims in the project design, uh, and the work is now in its final stages. So far, we've got over 500 refits uh, and 50 refit groups. I won't go through these individually, um, but with the first... Oh, I lost my place. Um, with the first one, uh, the site which was asking, is the site of Palimpsest or was it occupied only once? The answer is that it does seem to be a homogenous site and with very little post-depositional disturbance. The second one, the chain of Peritoire, um, it should allow comparisons with other sites in the UK and Europe. Um, more detailed look at the manufacture of tools on the site. Uh, here, the use and the resharpening of the tools seems to be very, very localized. Uh, but the relationship of the, map of the tools to the napping sequence is still a bit unclear. And the rest is still in progress. And hopefully we'll be able to report that in future. So this is a scatter plot produced by Oxford Archaeology of all the material found on the site. The density plot does indicate that there are two main clusters uh, of the flint artifacts. The northern part of the site and the southern part of the site. They do seem to be discrete episodes of napping. Uh, and there are, although there are a few, there are not many refits between the two groups. In addition, some of the squares slightly outside of those dense bins areas contain concentrations of core rejuvenation flakes, uh, suggesting that individual napping events are also likely to be very localized within the sites. I've got a couple of pictures of some of the refits. Uh, these are by Ian Cartwright at the Institute of Archaeology, and the work on the photography of the site again has just really just begun. This particular refit group here is typical of several on the site, uh, in that it represents early stages of core preparation. There's a similar style of napping in most of these cases, especially regarding the initial shaping of the cores, the use of cresting, and then the consistent rejuvenation of platforms and breaking places throughout the process. Uh, a lot of the cobbles, they seem to be um, derived from the chalk, perhaps from not very far away. In these stages, although there is a little bit of hard hammer, most of the napping sequence is soft hammer, uh, and as I said before, some of the soft hammer from very long, well-made plates. This, this, this refit group um, it perhaps shows the most visible evidence that there are things missing in the Guildford sequence. What you have here is you've got a very large crested blade from those preliminary stages of manufacture. You've also got little worked out core with quite a lot of little rejuvenation flakes. Um, On this, this core especially, there are many others, what seems to be happening is they're setting up these cores for making large blades, but the blades aren't there. There are some, some long, curved, well-made blades at the site, but a lot of them are used for tools. The rest of these sequences are just not present on the site. Oh, it's possible that they're an automated part of the site. Of course, we could have missed them, but I think it's highly likely that these were probably collected up and exported off the site by the Indians. Most of the flint is very high quality, derived from the chalk. Um, 
But there were occasionally other materials used. Uh, this particular core here is made on a river cobble, probably from the gravels of the river way, not far away from the site. Um, it's not quite as well mapped as the other examples, but it is well integrated with rain scatter on, and it's hard to see it being intrusive. And of course, as well as the napping reef at groups, uh, we do have some of the tools on the sides have also got the bits indicating that they use these are a few of the, the drawings. Other tools found on the sides are broken, um, as I mentioned before. So, refitting can certainly help understanding what happens within the site, but this meeting is supposed to be about the landscape focus, so I'm returning to this view here to remind ourselves of the landscape setting of the site. Just north, there's the fire station, just north of this gap here uh, in the chalk escarpments. Um, this is probably the source of most of the flint raw material you worked at the site. And Paul, I know you have a look at uh, the flint raw material from way down the farm, but I don't think you have a very definitive um, answers where it might be from. Did you look at the North Downs? Um, and I'm asking that because if you follow about 17 kilometers down the Way Valley, you'll find that's where May Way Manor Farm is. It's, uh, it's another major valley of site that we've heard about in passing from Lyndon several times today. Um, I said the distance is probably less than a day's journey. I don't think it's unreasonable to start thinking about these sites and how they might work in the landscape together, and indeed if they were connected to each other in any way. Um, it's worth perhaps noting that in Lyndon's report, preliminary observations are of the two assemblages, there are very distinct similarities between the two sites. Two assemblages are similar. Wayman Farm, as you've heard, is reported as having a significant number of well-made blades brought into the site in a low proportion of the initial stages of core preparation, almost a complement of Guildford. Um, not flying the kite and saying that they're going to be refits between the two sites, but perhaps we should start thinking about the patterning where the Guildford might be an extraction site, taking things to sites like, um, like Wayman Farm. So just to conclude, a couple of key points. The Upper Fire Station is an example of a well-preserved upper Paleolithic open-air site, uh, surviving just under the present land surface. Um, refitting shows the assemblages for modules <coughs> with no major disturbances. It also shows the flint material was probably being acquired in the near vicinity and was being worked to produce blades, and that some of those blades were probably being exported. Microware, however, shows a variety of other activities were going on at the site, and there's a high potential for looking at similar sites in the same river catchment. Guildford Fire Station should not be seen in isolation. And just to end up, I'd like to thank all of the people and the organisations working on the project, and deeply apologise to anyone I might have left off the list. <laughs>